what we brought that came with us. Baseball helped get us through the internment. The Vancouver Asahi were among the 22,000 Japanese Canadians interned during the Second World War. The team never played another game. Your connection to people, to communities, to our country. Your connection to the full story. CPAC, created by cable for Canadians. Justin Trudeau celebrates at a Montreal metro station. Andrew Shear speaks to the media in Regina. And Jagmeet Singh answers questions in Burnaby, British Columbia. It's time to have your say. Welcome to the program. I'm Mark Sutcliffe. Thank you for joining us today on the day after the federal election. We now know the results of Canada's 43rd election campaign. What kind of government will we see in the weeks and months ahead? Where will the liberal minority find support for its agenda? And will the parties change their approach and tactics after a divisive and sometimes nasty campaign? There are many angles to explore in the aftermath of a very interesting election. Our question to you today, will a liberal minority government be good for Canada? Call us at 1-877-296-2722 or tweet us at CPAC underscore TV. You can also email us at haveyoursay at cpac.ca. Joining us for our discussion today are CPAC's Martin Stringer and John Ibbotson, writer at large for The Globe and Mail. Welcome to both of you. Hello, Mark. Hello. Martin, you were on the ground in Atlantic Canada for much of this campaign. What did you observe there and how did it play into the results yesterday? Well, first, one of the things I would mention is being on the ground in Atlantic Canada was a privilege. And the, I mean, one of the reasons was because it really challenges one of the things you mentioned about how nasty the campaign was. When you're in small communities uh, of a few thousand people and even sometimes much bigger, uh, the candidates were really, really, uh, the, it's, very, it's really pleasant to see them avoiding a lot of the personal attacks, the invective and all that. The cant and the, and the diatribe was really toned down so that was good what I saw was um, also a region that was very much um, very much focused on issues that most people down there don't feel are being addressed by the the major political leaders um, the continuing exodus of young people economic development writ large and health care which is obviously a provincial jurisdiction for the most part but so th they were big issues but climate change was huge mm. um, and it was very interesting to see the play obviously there was not a huge sweep uh, the the region stayed uh, for the most part liberal but it was fascinating to watch that riding of Fredericton, which we spent time and did a profile of, and see the uh, Fredericton riding, which produced the first green uh, candidate in Atl Atlantic Canada. The, the three-way split that was right. produced in there was, was fascinating. But it was, it was a great experience. Yeah. All right, John, what do you make of the results? What do you think? Well, um, so first and foremost, I have all of my um, life as a journalist believe that voters are wise. And um, uh, the day after an election, you look at the result and you go, that was a wise decision. And if I think if you look at each region of the country, Atlantic Canada, Quebec, Ontario, the West, in each of those regions, voters um, cast ballots that made sense within that region. Uh, so that's good. Uh, another thing that's good is we have a stable minority government. Um, Mr. Trudeau will be able to govern with the consent of any one of the parties. I think most often it will be with the NDP. It will take all of the parties combined uh, to force uh, an election. So I think barring some kind of political crisis, and Lord knows they do come along, um, Mr. Trudeau will be able to govern as Prime Minister for as long as he wants, um, probably three years if, if, uh, if that's what he'd like to do. Hmm. Um, that said, I wrote an essay for The Globe on the weekend that, that worried about the possibility of grave regional divisions in the country, and that has sadly come true. Um, Quebec, uh, Quebecers voted heavily to bring the Bloc Québécois back to life. Uh, they have more than 30 seats in the House of Commons now. They are a force. Um, and of course the Liberals were essentially shut out of Western Canada outside of uh, Winnipeg and, uh, and Vancouver. Uh, shut out completely uh, of, of from Alberta and Saskatchewan. That's going to produce serious tensions. We'll get into the, uh, the, the nitty-gritty of that. 
But the country is less united now than it has been for quite some time in the past. And the fact that the Conservatives won the popular vote and lost the election is going to stoke resentments for those who supported th the Conservatives and can understand why they're not in government. Right. Great observations. Uh, going back to the first point that you made, uh, I, I know it's we can often portray the election result as one decision, but of course it wasn't. It was uh, 18 million individual decisions, uh, and the net result of it is the outcome that we have to live with now. Uh, so uh, it wasn't a group of Canadians getting together and saying, hey, well, the consensus is let's have a liberal minority, right? It was the net effect of a whole bunch of separate decisions, like if the three of us got in a car and you wanted to go to Toronto and Martin wanted to go to Montreal and we ended up in North Bay, right? No, it, was, it was 338 separate elections. Yeah. But uh, in each one of them you could say, Atlantic Canada, well, we decided that we would, let, we would bring back uh, the Liberals, but we would teach them a lesson by uh, giving uh, the NDP a seat in uh, Newfoundland and Labrador. Yeah. We would You're still consolidating the, the decisions in these scenarios. Increase conservative strength, bring in a green. Yeah. Uh, and you, I think you can go through uh, all the regions and say, well, that, each one of those ridings, the voters made what was for them a sensible choice. Right. So, uh, Martin, I think it is fair, as John did, to describe this as a stable minority. Yeah. Uh, yeah. There are, uh, it, technically speaking, there are majority governments and minority governments, but there are different kinds of minority governments. Mm -hmm. It would have been different if the Liberals won 130 seats right. instead of 157, right? And I think one of the things that we're all trying to parse right now is how will that stable minority government function? Because we mm -hmm. just watched uh, this afternoon, we just watched uh, uh, Yves-Francois uh, Blanchet, the head of the BQ, and we're parsing through what he's saying in terms of might he be the, uh, the, the, the party that supports the Liberals? Uh, might the NDP? Might there be an exchange between one or the other? Both uh, the Conservatives on some issues like pipelines, could they be? So, so it's, it's going to be a system where it is relatively stable, but I think right now we're all trying to sort of read the tea leaves in terms of who's sending out what message. Uh, Yves-Francois Blanchet in his press conference this afternoon was very enigmatic. Uh, he's preferred to sort of poke fun at the NDP and saying, I think the NDP is going to have some difficult decisions with regards to whether they support the pipelines or not. And then he said, well, our position is we don't support the pipelines, but he didn't go as far as saying we couldn't support the government on that basis. And he's sent out a lot of feelers saying, or suggestions saying that they can support the government or that they would like to see the the system, uh, he says he's a, no desire bringing the government down for the next 18 months. So, so I think we're all trying to sort of get a sense of how this stable minority government is going to work and it's, it's a very interesting period. Yeah. Over the next few weeks we'll probably learn more. We had expected, John, that uh, there might be a scenario where there'd be all kinds of negotiations going on right now to figure out who was going to support whom and, and, and what that would look like, what kind of trading would have to take place. Uh, that's obviously not going to be the case. The Liberals have a government, they're going to move forward. Uh, in fact, I would say if you if you didn't know the results when you watched Justin Trudeau's speech last night, you might have thought he'd won a second majority. Yeah, I mean, and there was a lot of stuff and nonsense about coalition governments yeah. and things like that. That's all gone, thank the Lord. <laughs> um, and as we said last week, uh, minority governments only are tested uh, at most twice a year. So Mr. Trudeau is going to introduce a throne speech. I don't think the word pipeline will be in that throne speech. Um, it'll be, it would be inconceivable that the op opposition parties would all combine to bring down the government on the throne speech. Well, then he had just has to get through to the next budget. Um, and again, he only needs the support of one party uh, to, uh, to, to clear that budget. Any one of the three uh, will do. Um, and then he's in the clear until the next budget a year later. So I think, it, again, it is very stable. It is it would be like Stephen Harper's government in 2008 very easy to govern, very hard to bring that government down. Um, it is, however, going to be a very expensive time uh, in this country. If you believe that we need to spend a great deal more money um, fighting climate change, um, good news for you. If you think it's time for pharmacare in this country, also good news. If you think that in times of um, sound economic growth, the budget should not be running 20, 30, 40 billion dollars into the red, bad news for you. Because the easy way for Mr. Trudeau to get through each budget is to simply spend an awful lot of money to placate the NDP right. and the bloc. And he's going to do that. Yeah, uh, one of the questions I have though, Martin, is that uh, I think th there was a scenario uh, where, uh, w w perhaps the one that many people expected, where the Liberals would be the ones in fear of the government falling and that they would constantly be trying to curry favor with one or more opposition parties to support them. 
Uh, it's quite possible that the reverse is true now, where it's the opposition parties who are more worried about the government falling and another election being triggered, and the Liberals can play a little bit of a game of chicken with them and almost govern like they have a majority and dare the opposition parties to bring them down. Right? Well, that's in mind. Uh, I mentioned, for example, Yves, uh, Yves Francois Blanchet, the, the, the bloc leader. Uh, I think he's very much, he's been given this massive gift of a 32-seat uh, uh, presence now in the House of Commons. I think he, and he sort of signals it last night, uh, he He's saying to himself, uh, no, things are relatively good. I've never had this kind of presence, and right now I'm not going to blow that. And so he's signaled, I'm not in this business for, uh, for bringing the government down in the next year to year and a half. And we, we forget what Gilles Duceppe was doing, every budget during the minority governments in 2004, 2006, and 2008. Uh, I remember running over to Gilles Duceppe, and that was a question. And, and usually he would say, no, no, we can live with this, we can live with this. Um, so yeah, he, he seems to be signaling that. The, uh, the NDP, I think, is probably going to think, as you say, uh, twice or three times before uh, doing anything precipitous because obviously you parties are also licking their wounds in that case and looking at their finances, looking at their, their status. Uh, do they want to try an election go, and go to an election? Um, I think that that scenario is probably good. It's an interesting, uh, it's an interesting one where the government w and the government also there's a potential of being able to seek different suitors uh, even with the possibility of getting support from the Conservatives if, if the bill were on say a pipeline bill or something right. like that. So yeah, it's an interesting scenario for Mr. Trudeau. Yeah, what do you think, John? Can the Liberals almost govern like they have a majority right now? Yes. You have to be careful. Yeah. Uh, Joe Clark made uh, that mistake in 1979. He won a, a pretty solid uh, minority government. By the way, he also lost the popular yes. vote. Uh, but he decided By that a substantial margin, in fact. Uh, indeed yeah. he did. Um, but he decided that he could govern as though he had a majority. He, the, the Liberals were in the midst of uh, choosing a new leader. Pierre Trudeau had stepped down. Um, he wanted to introduce an austerity budget, um, and, uh, and he did, and he didn't count how many votes there were out against him, and he was defeated. Um, Mr. Trudeau's big decision, in fact, I think the biggest decision Mr. Trudeau has to make right now is who will be his House leader. Uh, he doesn't have a lot of real veterans in cabinet. Uh, the loss of Ralph Goodale, uh, in Saskatchewan is going to be a serious blow to him because he needs someone who's been around the block a few times who knows how to count votes who knows how to get into a room and maybe pour a drink or two and talk to the other house leaders and get a, le a legislative agenda through um, but barring any kind of you know act of rank foolishness as I said I think Mr. Trudeau governs until he chooses not to govern this mm. government my prediction is this government will choose its defeat rather than being defeated right uh, he needs somebody who's been around the block and somebody who's been around the block mm. right in both in both cases potentially now having said that John and I don't disagree with you but a lot can change in a short period of time in politics right so uh, it could be that a year from now things look very different from how they do today uh, and uh, and it could be that the uh, opposition at that time smells blood or a year and a half from now that kind of thing right absolutely it has to be something a political crisis as I mentioned of such magnitude that the Conservatives the Bloc Québécois um, and the NDP all decide the government must be defeated yeah um, that takes a lot but we've seen it in the past I want to look at this uh, Martin from the perspective of the Conservatives uh, I think uh, if you'd ask people before the election uh, what kind of numbers would Andrew Scheer need to get to keep his job? What kind of numbers would, would guarantee that he lose his job? Uh, if he'd ended up with 100 to 110 seats, I think most people would agree he probably would have been finished. If he'd ended up with 130 or more seats, I think most people would have said uh, he would get to keep his job for sure. He's kind of in the middle, yeah. right? He's right on the cusp. Uh, so I think there will be a lot of questions about how much longer he'll be the Conservative leader and whether he'll take the party into another election. Well, that's why last night's speech was very interesting because some people have said last night's speech was uh, not very charitable and he sort of made it sound like a second, you know, he was relaunching a new campaign. Yeah. Last night's speech was doing two things. He was addressing the party faithful who were frustrated that they hadn't gone over the, they hadn't made it over the hump and, and gotten the results they wanted. But he was also addressing immediately, no, here is the state of the party according to me and here's and again today in his press conference or his uh, meeting with reporters uh, in Regina he stressed the popular voters as John has mentioned that they did come first in the popular vote that they didn't do as, you know, as badly as that yeah it's, it's a very very delicate situation that he finds himself in I, as you say I don't think he's on that he's on that cusp of being in a comfortable position or not and yeah I think that's going to be up to conservatives to decide yes. I'll leave that up to them yeah and we'll yeah. see how that plays out in the days ahead uh, uh, John was this a, a missed opportunity for the conservatives do you think yes absolutely um, 
they did get more votes than the Liberals, but those votes were heavily concentrated in the Prairie Provinces. Um, you might have heard me say once or twice or a thousand times that the 905 elects the government. Mm -hmm. I actually thought, I believe I mentioned it last week, that, that they might prove me wrong this time, that mm -hmm. the 905 might split the, the suburban ridings outside Toronto. They always vote as a bloc. They've done that since the 1960s with one exception. Um, and they always vote for whatever turns out to be the government because there are just so many of them. And they did it again. They voted massively for the Liberals and, that, and they are why Justin Trudeau is Prime Minister. But if you're a Conservative, you have to ask yourself, why did the Conservatives make no inroads into suburban ridings? 68% of Canadians live in suburbs. And apart from the ones in the prairies, they had no real successes, especially in the suburbs around Toronto. That is a big failure for uh, Andrew Scheer. And he has to address that. And if he cannot address that, there will be people at the leadership review in about six months' time uh, who will be addressing it for him. And I just, yeah, and, and I would add to that, in addition to the 905 uh, analysis, having come from about 36 days on the road in Atlantic Canada, uh, there was not there was a, a, an area too that was ripe for the picking. There were writing after writing after writing where the traditional voting pattern actually favored the Conservatives, and a lot of writings people were waiting for them to swing back. Um, there, set, there were two writings that were held by the Liberals that had never re-elected a Liberal, Cumberland, Colchester, and Central Nova, and they re-elected a Liberal that's never been done in history. Uh, there, I. W I I think it's fair to say there wasn't a lot of enthusiasm for Andrew Scheer, the leader. There was not a lot of talk about, nobody was campaigning on Andrew Scheer. Nobody was campaigning on any sort of sense of personality or personal appeal. Uh, basically the campaign was on the local candidates and on the conservative brand per se. So there is that and that, that I think you can generalize in terms of what we saw riding to riding. It was very much on the tradition and on individual candidates and issues. John, uh, because I know you uh, enjoy talking about a lecture in history in Canada, I'm going to put two scenarios in front of you. There's the 1972-74 scenario and there's the 2004-2006 scenario. Uh, in each case, uh, you have a minority government, uh, or a, sorry, a, uh, a government that had a majority that was brought to a minority. And then in the subsequent election in 1974, that government got a majority again. In 2006, that government lost the election. Uh, Andrew Scheer is portraying this as though it's 2004 and that he is on his way to eventually beating Justin Trudeau in the next federal election. Uh, there are probably some liberals who feel like it's going to be the 1974 scenario. Uh, what's your best guess about uh, where we're headed? And, and is Andrew Scheer, uh, is, is, is he accurate when he portrays this as, hey, we, we came close to beating Justin Trudeau, we're making progress, we're, we're on the right path here. On its face, it's 1972. That doesn't mean it will play out, right. but on its face, it's 1972. So a majority government, uh, one led by Trudeau, has been reduced to a minority government. Uh, but it can govern with the consent of the NDP. It doesn't need anyone else. 1972, Pierre Trudeau uh, did a very good job of asking the NDP, so what do you want? and giving it to them. And by the way, it was the beginning of turned out to be 25 years of deficits uh, because the, the bill that the NDP uh, presented uh, was, was a very expensive one. But if Justin Trudeau uh, goes to Jagmeet Singh and says, well, I'm ready to talk pharmacare. I'm ready to talk uh, increasing the climate uh, tax, carbon tax. I'm interested in talking about a, house, a national housing strategy. Um, are you interested as well? then I think uh, he could be a revived uh, a government uh, that on its way to a majority. But this is politics, and we know how long a week is in politics. There are things troubling this government. Again, the SNC-Lavalin affair um, is not put to bed yet. Um, Mr. Trudeau has shown time and time again that he has poor political judgment, um, and he's going to need to get much smarter if he's to make sure that 72 is the model and not 2004. Yeah. Has he restored his footing in any way here? Has he, uh, some liberals may take this as some sort of absolving of, of everything that's happened to this date. A reset button has been pushed. Is, is that the case or is that uh, overstating the fact? I think it would be seriously overstating the fact. The worst mistake the liberals could make would be to believe that last night was a, was a success for them. This is a Quebec prime minister on his watch separatism revived as a force in Quebec with the Bloc Québécois. Now, I don't think the Bloc is actually running on a separatist right. mandate, but they're there. They've said they aren't. Yeah. Uh, there, there are more than 30 um, separatist 
seats mm -hmm. in, in Quebec. And again, the results in, in Western Canada were dismal. Uh, the, the Liberals were essentially shut out, uh, uh, apart from Winnipeg and Vancouver. Um, th and they lost the popular vote. Uh, so those are all areas in which the Liberals should feel chastened um, and humbled uh, and contrite. I don't s detect as yet that, that contrition on the part of the Prime Minister. I would, I would throw one thing on to uh, in, onto the uh, the Quebec aspect of this election, and that is it's, it's probably one thing that people may not be looking towards, and that is at a certain point the Quebec courts will rule on Bill 21, and that at a certain point that will be turfed up to the Supreme Court, and at a certain point, and this is exactly the language that the Prime Minister and the, his Liberal candidates in Quebec have been using, at a certain point the Feds will have to intervene. Uh, so what happens to Bill 21, and if it were, for example, struck down by the Supreme Court, you're going to have a very different dynamic exploding in Quebec, partly the same dynamic that fed Francois Legault's success and the Bloc's success. They basically hitched their wagon in a massive way. A lot of Quebecers didn't identify it, but a lot of the popularity of the Bloc, it's obvious, uh, was associated with that position on Bill 21. Uh, and we even had Francois Legault at the very beginning of the, uh, uh, the, of the election saying, don't touch Bill 21. And for the most part, the federal candidates and the federal uh, party leaders didn't touch Bill 21, but that is going to come home to roost at some but point. But if too. you are an opponent of Bill 21, yeah. if you see it as a discriminatory piece of legislation yeah. um, that discriminates against uh, religious minorities, in the province of Quebec and that it should be struck down, last night was a very bad night for you hmm. because uh, the Bloc Québécois took more than 30 seats in defense of Bill 21. Jagmeet Singh has already said that he doesn't think the federal government should get involved in this fight. Um, and Justin Trudeau has said, well, intervention if necessary, but not necessarily intervention. There is no political gain now for the Liberals to have anything to do with Bill 21. I think, in fact, they yeah. won't intervene. But it, yeah, but it's a delicate, because I, I, I talked to one of his star candidates in Longueuil writing, and it is amazing how they're parsing their words. He said, at a certain point, it may be opportune for us to intervene. And I said, also, oh, you're saying that, that you should intervene. And his point was, he, the point they're making is, well, yes, there are other rights that could be uh, challenged as well, like minority Francophone rights and all that. So they're obviously testing the waters as to whether they will actually yeah, have to intervene eventually, yeah. All right, let's see what some of our viewers think about the outcome of this federal election. We'll start with a call from Richard, who's in Peterborough, Ontario. Hello, Richard. Hi, Mr. Ibbotson. Thanks very much for having me on your program. Uh, my take on this election is as follows, that there needs to be a grander vision for Canada, that hopefully uh, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau and his minority government could take a a note from Lester Pearson's prime ministership where in 1963 he was able to accomplish great things as a minority government uh, where I'd, I'd like to use John Ibbotson's comments on history and congratulate him also on his astute columns in the Globe about our national unity. Uh, in this case I'd like to like in terms of back to the future 1963 with Prime Minister Pearson uh, the things he accomplished uh, for example, the Canada Pension Plan, we need a national unity plan for Canada to join the schisms and divisions. Uh, to He ended capital punishment. We need a national program to end the opioid crisis. It's killing people uh, right across our country. Uh, he also, uh, Lester Pearson, unified the armed forces. The armed forces were conspicuously absent in the election campaign. Uh, the PTSD the treatment of veterans or our national defense policies. Uh, the Chinese Navy is going to show up in the Northwest Passage in the next five or ten years. Uh, there are missiles to destroy satellites that do the surveillance. Uh, how are we going to cope with threats to our sovereignty and our 35,000-mile coastline right around our country? Uh, national defense didn't, uh, the periscope never appeared during the entire uh, campaign. And uh, I, in terms of Margaret, uh, uh, the author that wrote the testament uh, uh, basically she said that history doesn't so much repeat itself as it rhymes and I, I see a rhyme here between the 1930s where countries drifted with their defense policies uh, they're going to acquire equipment uh, on a manana basis our procurement of naval vessels is stalled out the same with the fighter planes uh, national defense should be a, a focus for this government together with the opioid crisis or even more so, affordable housing. We have a national crisis in affordable housing from Vancouver's east side to Peterborough's Victoria Park uh, to Nanaimo, a desolate camp. Uh, 
these issues need to be dealt with in a mature way versus petty partisanship. Okay, Richard, thank you very much for your call. Let's go to Joseph in Winnipeg. Hello, Joseph. Hi. Hi, go ahead. I just want to thank uh, Justin Trudeau for uh, getting rid of uh, cheer because uh, uh, our next leader will be Peter McKay. So you think Andrew Scheer is finished as conservative oh, leader? Oh, yeah, definitely. Uh, he's definitely uh, finished. And uh, uh, the, re the reason I'm saying that, uh, if I was the leader and he kept bringing up, uh, uh, blaming uh, Scheer for uh, the deficit in Ontario and Doug Ford, that's... That's really stupid. I would have cleaned the house with uh, Trudeau on that matter because Ontario were the ones that won the election, nobody else. Thank you. All right, thank you for your call. Uh, Bob in Chilliwack, British Columbia. Hello, Bob. Hi, how are you guys? Good, thank you. Okay, sorry. <clears throat> go ahead. Oh, okay. Um, I'm just going to go a quick one to strategy and then a couple of other points. On the strategy thing, I hate to do this to the Conservatives, but as an outside observer looking in, could the Conservatives um, survive, uh, or could Peter McKay survive being the Conservatives? If you remember what happened to Ronna Ambrose when she basically made sure that that party was in one piece and healthy to move into the next election cycle and for the next leader, she was still uh, accused by people within her party of acting in her own self-interest. And th those same population said, if you will, prevent any leader of the Conservatives, at least as I see it from the outside looking in, from reaching out past their traditional base. So as soon as somebody tries to reach beyond the base, then it would seem that they would shut that guy down. So I don't think Peter McKay might, have, might enjoy any greater success than Andrew Scheer would, so I wouldn't blame the leader right away. Now for the, the minority parliament, um, I hope that everybody, this includes the MPs that we elected, this also includes all the staff, political and otherwise, that all these people are going to drag to Ottawa with them, check their self-interest and their ambition at the door and bring their adult selves and only their adult selves into that situation. To the rookies, do not be overwhelmed by finding yourselves in Parliament. Actually, you've got a coach for that. Jody Wilson-Raybould will be there to uh, show you what it's like to deal with situations that don't quite make sense to you, where it's uh, not necessarily the best thing just to uh, take instruction um, just because it's instruction, because you might be a rookie, especially when it comes to something that matters. Because I believe if everybody is disciplined, and this happens person to person, so I might be, you know, wishful thinking here, then I think this minority government will be okay. And as far as uh, financial risks, I think Trudeau may have actually borrowed to his limit. Even if he had a majority government, he can't borrow forever. There would be caps on that. And if I can add one more thing, it might have been a blessing that we missed that monk debate on foreign affairs, considering what's going on around in the world, because that might have been a blessing in disguise, if you will, so that we didn't do any injury to ourselves having that particular argument with some of the, the issues that are out there at this point um, end up in the public sphere in the context of an election campaign, because I don't think uh, Rujard would even be able to keep them from attacking themselves in sort of a negative matter that might, uh, if you will, put information out there that might mislead some of these people that we may or may not be concerned about okay, Bob. Uh, worldwide. Okay, Thank you very much for your call, Bob. I appreciate it. We'll go to Al in St. Catharines, Ontario. Hello, Al. Hey, Mark. How are Hi. you? Good. Thank you. I'm uh, very happy today that uh, Mr. Trudeau won 157 seats rather than, say, 130. I've seen these uh, minority governments that are pretty close and it's always uh, people really don't want to go to another election in a hurry. They like to wait at least two or three years. And uh, I'm one of those that think that everybody should be given a chance, even in a minority. But, uh, you know, it's just uh, I think it'll work because there's people there that have goodwill. And uh, if Mr. Scheer uh, puts in some goodwill, I think that... Uh, this minority parliament can work quite well, even for four years. Mr. Blanchett said that. He said he would like to do it for four years. And I agree. People can work together with different ideas, and minority governments do that. They make people that are in power sort of listen to the other guys. And I think that's great. But as I said, I like Mr. Trudeau's uh, personality. His ideas are 
like good ideas. It was uh, worked quite well for us over the last four years. The infrastructure and the economy and the unemployment rate low and indigenous uh, people being helped. You know, so generally speaking, I think that Mr. Shear lost it by. I, I had phoned in after the debate, and I said he's doing too many personal attacks, and. What I found from people that I talked to, and I talked to lots of people about that, and they said, I don't like Mr. Shear because he's always a, uh, so negative and uh, going after Trudeau. And, uh, you know, it doesn't sound good. It's like your neighbor always picking away at his wife, and you're listening, and you hear it, and you know what? You don't like that guy. Right. All right, well, Al. I think that's where he blew it. Thank you very much for your call. Keith is in Airdrie, Alberta. Hello, Keith. Hi, how you doing? Good, thank you. All right, thanks for taking my call. Um, just got a question, quick question for the panel there. Um, with the um, uh, the the block, I'm just wondering why they're on the stage in the debate. Because uh, <coughs> is it because they have their own governments and their own decisions? Because other uh, provinces. <coughs> How and why don't they do the same thing? And the provinces set up their own government. And yeah, it's not about them government. having their own government. It's, it's about the fact that the uh, Bloc Québécois had a certain number of seats and a certain number of uh, a certain percentage of the popular vote in the last election. With, uh, so they they qualified for the debates. Um, so I think there's. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Okay, so uh, for example, to, to answer your question more directly, Keith, if yeah, if uh, sure. if a if a party formed in Alberta. And they okay. had uh, 20 seats in Alberta, or 10 seats, or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, then, and they met the same criteria. Yeah, then yes, they right. by the current rules, which may change by the current that's rules, they I would have, they would have been allowed in the debate. Okay, so yeah. that's what I thought. So, like, because the reason why I asked that question, I'll be real uh, quick, because you got a lot of calls. Is at uh, I've walked along. <laughs> Like in Alberta, and talk to a lot of people, and saying, and they're the same in the same bout as, oh, this is upsetting, like very upset, and they're asking the same questions to myself and other people. I don't know, I can find out, and this is the way I found out, and I thank you for the answer. All right, thank you very much for your call, Martin. Just two, two reflections. As, as people are calling in, and, and as you started the discussion, it's amazing, and John would probably concur, deja vu all over, uh, 1993, the Reform Party, the alienation in the West, the West wanting in, and then the Bloc Québécois <coughs> electing the largest largest number of seats, and the debate over whether they should, were even qualified to become the, the uh, Her, Her Majesty's loyal opposition. I mean, plus ça change, plus c'est le même. It's, it's amazingly, uh, you know, it's, 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 um, you're really going back to memories that are familiar, um, not saying it's good or bad, it's definitely was a more divided time. Um, but the other thing was Richard's point about defense. Uh, did It leaves me to think about one thing. He mentioned the two aspects of defense that come up. And it, I am not party to the internal strategist for the liberals or the conservatives. But one has a hunch that the liberals came riding in on a promise to treat veterans better and to do procurement completely differently. The two biggest bugaboos in all of Canada's defense policy have always been the incredible way we go about procurement, the multi-billion dollar <coughs> contracts, and also the, the treatment that's reserved for our veterans. So they went sweeping in on that, but they find themselves equally impaled on both issues. So one gets the sense that Nobody, uh, I don't think the Tories uh, made it a huge issue either because I think they were both feeling very vulnerable on that issue. That might be an explanation to Richard's point about why defense, those two aspects of defense weren't raised in this, in this election. That's just a thought. All right, let's go back to the phones. Anne is calling from Etobicoke, Ontario. Hello, Anne. Yes. Hi, go ahead. What I want to know is why is there nothing being said about the deficit? It is. It was promised that uh, he would get rid of it. He hasn't done that. Not, nobody is saying anything about it. Well, I think it was discussed quite a bit during the campaign, uh, but the reality is none of the political parties right now uh, have been proposing to eliminate the deficit in, in short order, apart from Maxime Bernier and the People's Party, who said they would do it within two years. Well, Tudor said that he would uh, get rid of it a lot sooner. Yep. But... Isn't it just practical that you uh, get rid of it so that you don't pay interest on that? Because the interest that uh, 
his bail on the, on the visit could do a whole lot more good. That's, that's certainly one way of looking at it. Anne, thank you very much for your call. Uh, next up is Rob in Lethbridge, Alberta. Hello, Rob. Rob, go Hello. ahead. Hi, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. I just wanted to, uh, I mentioned to your producer that uh, about a year ago I predicted on my Twitter feed that there was no possible way that Andrew Scheer could win the election based on his kind of a Casper milk toast personality. I, I actually sent an email off to them begging them to run Pierre Pelliev or someone else that could put some heart and soul into it. And my second point was that uh, I was through the first Trudeau thing in Alberta here in the NEP, and in the last uh, 48 hours or so, I have never heard so much actual people talking way past the point of being mad about separation, but where do we go to organize? Where do we send their money? And who is going to lead us? in the separation move. It's, it's actually quite scary. All right. Thank you for your call. Kenny in Chilliwack, British Columbia. Hello, Kenny. Hi. Uh, Hi. Seniors like me that are living below poverty, less than $1,700 a month, who controls Indian affairs in B.C., the federal government or the provincial government? Because it's the NDP government, I think, that put uh, clawback on First Nations people that took early retirement. I've been on old age pension for 15 years, and I'm living below poverty. Because in BC, $2,200, anything below 2,200 is poverty. I'm living at uh, 17, less than 1,700 a month, and the government of BC's got a clawback on me for early retirement. And it's right. been 15 years. I'm well, I'm sorry. I'm sorry to hear that, Kenny. Money Thank you. The money. Thank you very much for your call. I, I, I sympathize with your circumstances. I want to keep the discussion focused on the outcome of the election and uh, where we go from here. Let's take a look at some of the comments we've received so far on social media. Reminder to use the hashtag CPACVote2019. This person writes, after a Doug Ford win for the Conservatives in Ontario and all the senseless cuts to the budget, I'm glad the Liberals won the election. After all, Scheer had $53 billion in cuts. He never explained where it would come from. Next person writes, politics just got much more complicated in Canada with differing economic principles battling across the country and prosperity versus socialism on the table. The very meaning of freedom will be challenged and changed over the next four years. Confederation is on the line. Cameron writes, I'm no longer Canadian. I am from Western Canada. Very interesting comment. This person, Chocolate Guitar, writes, Liberal minority was my preferred outcome, so yes, I think it will be good for Canada, provided that the parties go into it with a collaborative, cooperative sort of spirit. I just wish that the Greens had more influence in Parliament. And finally, Laura writes, this is the best scenario. Since everyone is so divided, they will all have to work together to get the job done. Could you imagine Parliament having to work for all of us and stop the whining? Thank you for all those comments. We're going to get to more of your thoughts coming up on this edition of Have Your Say. One thing that will be different, Martin, I think that's worth talking about is the committee structure. Yeah. Uh, and, and I know the opposition was frustrated at different times during the investigation into the SNC-Lavalin affair about the fact that the Liberals could shut down different mm -hmm. lines of inquiry, shut down the committee proceedings. The Liberals will no longer have a majority on these committees. No, and we'll see whether they produce what Stephen Harper produced, and that was a binder telling people how to navigate committees in a minority parliament because the committees were a real show. Uh, and I mean that in a positive and negative way. The, the, the fight in committees when you don't have a majority to slam things through means that there are other procedural tactics you try to use to get your legislation through committee. And it is, it's true that it will be very interesting for parliamentary reporters who watch this because there were really good Donny Brooks and very good debates uh, during the Harper years of the minor minority governments and the, the minority government of uh, Paul Martin uh, because things in committee did get fully uh, debated uh, and sometimes rejected and modified and amended and all that. Yeah, it, it, it's going to be a whole different era up on the Hill. That's for we parliamentary reporters, it's definitely sure. a difference, yeah. But will there be more latitude for the opposition to pursue yeah. the SNC-Lavalin 
inquiry? SNC Lavalin, I don't know. That's a good question. I mean, yeah. I'm not sure whether that's going to be reopened, but uh, certainly everything of that nature will sure. get a whole, have yeah. a whole different. John, outcome. what do you think? Well, if it, I don't know that SNC Lavalin will get relitigated unless something new comes up yeah. in the way, perhaps, of an RCMP investigation. Yeah. Uh, but the next big scandal or crisis, whatever it is, will get litigated in parliamentary committees. But Mr. Trudeau has an advantage here that Paul Martin didn't have. Um, the Bloc Québécois is new to the scene again, and the NDP and the Jagmeet Singh um, is a, a, a party again where there aren't that many old veterans yeah. left. The leader is himself inexperienced, and many of the new arrivals uh, are just that, new arrivals. So it helps if you're going to hold the government's feet to the fire in a parliamentary committee to know your way around a parliamentary committee. And I think the Liberals are going to be in a better sh uh, state um, than certainly the Bloc or the NDP in terms of, of knowing how to navigate that. So that, w that could work in their favor. Let's talk more about the role of the Bloc going forward. Uh, John, you mentioned earlier that uh, they are sovereigntists, but uh, they're not necessarily pursuing that agenda. Uh, what will it mean that the Bloc is back in, uh, they, look, they, they were never completely gone, but uh, they certainly had been reduced to a small number of seats in the last couple of elections. Uh, what does it mean that they're a force again? Well, look, they are obviously delighted to be back in the House of Commons in, in such numbers, but it will be frustrating for Mr. Blanchett because he, he doesn't hold the balance of power. If the Bloc had taken eight more seats in Quebec, if they'd gotten up to around 40 and pushed the Liberals down uh, themselves into the 140s, then the NDP would not on its own have been sufficient to produce a parliamentary majority. But because the Liberals did as well as they did, they don't need the Bloc Québécois. Uh, they can, on any given day, if they keep themselves on the right side of the NDP, govern and without the bloc support. To the extent they ever do find themselves uh, in need of bloc support, well, we know what, what the Bloc Québécois wants. They want greater control over immigration in Quebec. They want greater control over cultural issues in Quebec. And they want taxation to be um, moved completely over to Quebec so that Quebec collects federal income taxes and sends the money to Ottawa rather than the other way around. Uh, again, if they had a few more seats, those would have been important agenda items that the Liberal government would have had to deal with if they wanted to or not. But I think, for now at least, uh, Mr. Trudeau can ignore them. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, Martin? on the block, I would say one of the interesting things was we just saw, uh, Canadians saw a period about 12 months ago where people were predicting the imminent demise of the block under Martine Ouellette um, because, because of her personal management style and leadership style, but also because of the inherent frustration in the block. And that is, we've seen this over the years. And that is, the, it, when the block goes into a period of hibernation in terms of its sovereigntist option, you get this internal, uh, this internal chemistry, this internal. Uh, friction of people who at a certain point start to chafe at the bit and say, well, okay, what are we here for in Ottawa? And I think Martine Ouellette's problems, and before her, the previous leader before that, it wasn't just their, their management and leadership style, but there were inherent problems built in with the bloc. My hunch, and this is totally unscientific and not borne out by any particular inside knowledge, but my hunch is that right now the bloc is in a good period. They're in a good place. And those sort of tensions that regularly emerge, uh, Gilles Deceptus has spoken about them, uh, that's a long way off for the bloc. The Bloc is uh, on a honeymoon with itself and its new status and its refound new lease on life. Uh, but once again, too, I would also say that uh, things like that can also be very much dependent on things like Bill 21. Right. Um, yeah, I was just going to say, I think the uh, whatever uh, this parliament lacks in terms of a big question around uh, sovereignty uh, be could, be, could be replaced with the, the issues ar arising from Bill 21. Right? Yeah. Yeah. But again, that, that is up to Mr. Trudeau. Um, he needs to keep on the right side of the government in Quebec City. Because really what the Bloc Québécois is in Ottawa is the Quebec government in Quebec City transplanted, as it were, to the national capital. So um, as long as the CAQ are happy with where Ottawa is going, the Bloc will be happy with where Ottawa is going. Uh, but on the other hand, Mr. Trudeau does not have to uh, do anything to placate uh, Doug Ford. He just took all the ridings at the federal level that Mr. Ford took at the provincial level. So he can say to Mr. Ford, I have my mandate from your voters. I don't need to listen to a thing you say. Mm -hmm. And I just said, and add a last point to that, and John hit the nail on the head too. The Bloc is never happier than when they have a perfect relationship with a kindred spirit in Quebec City. And we used to always get the goat of Blocis when we tease them and say the mother ship is calling, la maison mayo, and that would be the BQ. So when there was a right. BQ and the PQ, there was a perfect synergy, and the National Assembly was passing motions that would 
bolster the block's positions and vice versa. Uh, here you have this incredible symmetry between the CAQ and, and the block in its current incarnation. And if uh, Yves-Francois uh, Blanchet has done something in a very good way, he's, he's, he's identified a very successful, at least for now, provincial government in the, in the CAC, the Coalition Avenir Quebec, and their policies, and he's, he's basically stuck to them. And right now everything's hunky-dory for them. Yeah. Okay, well, let's return to your opinions on the election. Roland is calling from Riche, Manitoba. Hello, Roland. Hey, hello, Mark. How are you? Hi, good, thank you. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, I just got to make a quick point here about, uh, uh, like, uh, Andrew Sherry had good policies and all that, but uh, I, I don't know if it uh, is campaign manager or what, but when he was doing these uh, leader tour uh uh, what do we call them? Television appearances, like on on, uh, on this on this station and others. Uh, like he he lacked like uh, the character, and uh, there was one day he was uh, uh, standing in front of a dead tree. Uh, like like climate people are looking at the background too, and they see a dead tree behind him and a body of water, and he had twelve or 15, 16 people there, and they pushed them all to off to one side. And he, he, he looked like he was just standing there alone, and people see that, you know, and every one of those TV appearances he did was like that. They were boring boring as hell. And, uh, you know, like... Uh, so do you blame this outcome on Andrew Shear then? Yeah, like, he, he, he could have run that uh, campaign a little better, I think. Uh, showed a little more uh, charisma, character, you know, uh, a little more fun in, in the campaign. And he, he stood there like a... Like a statue, really. And that, that one day with the tree stump in the back, well, I couldn't believe that. Yeah. There's a lot of, a lot of young people with climate change and all that, and you see a dead tree behind them. And uh, he, he had a chance to show these 12, 16 people uh, behind him uh, supporting him. And he pushed them all to one side, and he stood there like a statue by himself. So uh, that's just my point. But okay. As far as a, a, a minority government, I think it could probably work not too bad. Okay, That's Roland. Basically, all I got to say. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, you know, it's easy to talk in hypotheticals, John, but um, uh, there will be some people who will believe that Ron Ambrose or Peter McKay or Jason Kenney, who, by the way, is expected to speak in a few minutes uh, uh, to give his reaction to the federal election as the Premier of Alberta, and we'll go there live when that happens, that one of those people or someone else would have done a better job. But of course, it's all hypothetical. If that, if that person were the leader of the party, uh, they would have been confronted with challenges and obstacles, and and uh, that person might have stumbled as well. Right? That's true. It's also true that any political party that loses an election, uh, especially one in which there was a real shot at them winning it, um, uh, will go into internal division, will yeah. suffer from internal divisions. Uh, the, the Conservative Party is required by its constitution to hold a leadership review uh, within the next few months. It'll probably be in April or May. Um, and at that time, the, the, the delegates will vote whether or not um, the, Mr. Scheer has their confidence. If someone like Peter McKay or Warren Ambrose or someone else um, genuinely believes that they could do a better job, they have the opportunity, um, if, or they also have the means, to challenge him at that convention. Hmm. I Martin? would pipe in one thing too. For example, one of our the earlier callers referred to Peter McKay and to Ron, Am Ron Ambrose. I will say one thing in in 40 years of covering political parties, I've never seen a situation where an interim party leader, i.e. Rona Ambrose, where you had more people from the party faithful saying to you, geez, we w really wish she could have stayed on. It was really, uh, I found that a real singular thing, uh, and that was a testimony to Rona Ambrose in terms of what she did to the, that party post Harper in terms of giving a new face and her management style and her leadership style. I'm not making a judgment about whether she could have done any, be any better than Andrew Shear, but it was a very particular thing for Andrew Shear to inherit after, with all these party faithful, including high, high ranking party members, saying to you, you know, we really botched it by having that rule where Rona Ambrose had to step down and she had to be interim. Um, I, that's just an observation. It was yeah. quite interesting. Uh, by the way, we're told now that Jason Kenney, the Alberta Premier, will be speaking at about 5.30 Eastern Time, uh, originally scheduled for 3 o'clock Eastern Time, now 5.30 Eastern Time. So uh, we'll go to that at that time, but we won't see that in the next few minutes here on CPAC. Let's turn back to your comments on social media and see what people are saying there about the outcome of this election. Again, our question today, do you think a liberal minority will be good for Canada? Mr. Dash writes, it could be. It simply means being able to secure the backing of a majority of MPs for your program. 
History shows minorities in the Westminster system here in the UK oftentimes were not all weak or ineffective or held to ransom by other parties. This person writes, sure it will be okay this time around. The only problem is the drama posted by the folks that say the sky is falling and Canada is more separated. It's no different than yesterday. Joseph writes, I'm deeply concerned about our national unity given the massive numbers that voted against Trudeau but without an effective vote. And I'm equally concerned about Canada continuing to be a laughingstock on the world stage. Trudeau has already changed this country for the worse and he should not have been allowed more time to do more damage. Canadians just wanted handouts and we will pay a price for this as will future generations. This is not new. Politicians just need to work together to get things done. Instead of focusing on differences, focus on common ground. This is good for the whole country. Just on the issue of division, John, uh, I do think it was interesting. Uh, we were talking about this over the last couple of days when the polls were showing the Liberals and the Conservatives at around 31, 32 percent. There has never been an election in Canadian history where at least one of those two parties didn't get at least 33 percent. And, uh, and as it turns out, both of them crossed that threshold in this election. But I haven't actually gone back and done the math. I'm guessing, though, that this, if you were to combine the Liberal and Conservative support in this election, that total would be the lowest combined total for those two parties in any election in Canadian history or close to it. That's a really good question, and I don't know the answer to that. Mm -hmm. Um, but what does it mean? I mean, it would be it would be low, certainly. Yeah, I mean, uh, so what does that mean? It's not Is as it though fragmentation. It, yeah, it's not as though the electorate did something uh, last night that surprised us. They had told us uh, throughout the entire election campaign that they weren't happy with Mr. Trudeau and they weren't happy with Mr. Scheer. Um, both parties had very low levels of support. In the end. Um, the, the Conservatives did win the popular vote over the Liberals, uh, but but lost in the seat counts. But again, um, especially when I listened to uh, Justin Trudeau last night, I was surprised at the lack of humility or contrition. Um, he's acting as though he's scored a tremendous victory. Well, it's a minority government, and yes, uh, he did it with a very low level uh, of popular support. Yeah, yeah I, I, I would guess, though, that everything's relative, right? And, and that uh, for Jagmeet Singh, the outcome of this election is a good one because it's relative to where the people thought the NDP was going to end up. Uh, for the same for Justin Trudeau. Mm -hmm. It's not uh, based on a comparison to where people thought it would be a year ago, but where people mm -hmm. thought he might tur turn out uh, a month ago. Well, on the, on the number crunching, is interesting because as you're saying that, I was also asking myself the same question. Uh, it would be interesting for all of our viewers, or we can do this as soon as we get off the set, to go and number crunch, for example, when you had the, the Reform Party in the West and you had the Bloc Québécois in 90s, um, I go back to 93, uh, it's an interesting question because they, they're you had significant proportions of the Canadian population that were saying, in a way, none of the above as well. So it is interesting. Yeah. But as you say, too, the other thing I think I, I still am passionately interested in seeing, and that is we've talked about how the minority government will act in terms of the interactions between the parties and how will this affect Justin Trudeau's management style? How will it affect his leadership style? How will it affect his caucus style? And I know some people have mentioned it, uh, Susan Delacourt in an article in the Toronto Star, but, and, and some insiders are even saying, they're quoting backbench MPs is saying, well, we're hoping that this will produce a different style of management because some of Justin Trudeau's worst problems uh, were of his own making in terms of managing certain crises uh, as witness to, uh, to ministers who resigned. So it will be interesting to see if this does change yeah. anything in how he, he does business. That's a good point, by the way, that in 1993, uh, <laughs> the Liberals the and the Conservatives, uh, the progressive Conservatives at the time right. under Kim Campbell, of course, they had their historically bad election. Yeah. They only got uh, six percent of the vote and um, so they added with the Liberals getting about 41 percent that added up to 57 this time around it's 67 percent going to those two main but parties. I think what we can say uh, and it's going to take about 90 seconds for Twitter to correct me if I'm wrong about this uh, but I think we, what we can say is that there has never been an election in which the govern the, the party that formed the government had a lower percentage of the popular vote as a result of the election I think you're right about that and yeah. that gets to the original point I think that John made and that is this was an election where and we found this in Atlantic Canada this was an election where people are saying we're giving them another minority but enough Canadians in those individual writings and in their individual decisions were saying but we're not thrilled by anything that's going on 
Um, yeah. And so, yeah, that was why I think commentators are quite funny creatures because they're all saying we're missing a narrative. We're missing a narrative. Maybe there isn't one narrative. Maybe it's, it's, it's 300, you know, 300, 338 narratives. Maybe it's uh, 36 million nar uh, narratives. But people seem to be saying that a lot of them didn't quite like the way things were going uh, in a lot of the parties and with a lot of the leaders. Yeah. So it, 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 it poses an interesting question. Yeah, I'm. I'm just looking back because I'm. I did a, uh, <laughs> Number I did a spreadsheet on this, and um, <coughs> in uh, let me see here. In 2004, uh, the Liberals won with 36 percent of the vote, and I'm pretty sure that was well. Hello. Yeah, uh, in in 2004, the Liberals won with 36 percent of the vote. Yeah, and that was uh, they won the popular vote and they formed a government, and that was the lowest uh, uh, high popular vote count. Uh, the lowest, highest popular vote count of any party in a federal election. Mm -hmm. uh, the exception being, uh, in terms of parties that formed a government, that in 1979, Joe Clark got only 35% of the vote. <coughs> but in that same election, even though they didn't form a government, the, the Liberals got 40% of the popular vote. Wow. There are some very so, weird ones. Yeah. Go back and, so go my, back and find My point is that you're right, John, that I think this election, Justin Trudeau has the lowest share of a popular vote of any... A, a party that's won the election, of course, and the, and that and that um, even Andrew Scheer has the lowest. The, Andrew Scheer and the Conservatives have the lowest winning percentage of the popular vote of any party in Canadian history. And somebody is throwing up the election of 1925 right now, because in that election the Liberals did not win the greatest number of seats. They nonetheless remained in government by um, forming, uh, by winning support of what was then called the Progressive Party. Yeah. That was uh, uh, Mackenzie King, and it led to the King Bing crisis. But they won 46 percent of the vote. Well, there you go. I stand corrected. <laughs> Uh, they might not have won the most seats, but they won a significant amount of the vote. Yeah. Um, so, you know, that is interesting to me that those numbers are so low, and um, and and I think there will be people who will point out that, in spite the numbers be of the numbers being low, uh, Justin Trudeau still looks like he won a lot of seats, right? I think That's you know. Function I, of the I would venture something in watching him last night. What he's sounding as if he's saying is that he's won an argument. That's what I'm hearing from him. Not so much I've won the election, I won the majority, right. but he seemed, it seems to be imbued with what we saw during so much of the campaign, and that was people very much ensconced in their, in their argument. Yeah. And he, uh, so in, on Andrew Scheer's side, it was uh, Justin Trudeau was completely yeah. wrong-headed on the economy, on the environment, on this and that, and Justin Trudeau, was, uh, the invective was equally strong about the Conservatives, and this, the sense is that we've won, we're safe, and we've won. The, and that's why I say it's going to be very interesting to see the, 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 yeah. the governing style in a minority gov government uh, with that kind of attitude still flowing over. Right. The argument is two thirds really of Canadians did not vote for the Liberals. Though. More than two thirds. This yeah. is true, but um, two thirds of Canadians did vote for political parties that like a carbon tax. Yeah. 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 And I think we're, what you're going to yeah. see is Justin Trudeau saying, "I won the argument That's on it. energy versus the environment." Yeah. Sure. Um, all of the parties uh, to the left of me want me to go stronger uh, on fighting global warming. So if you didn't like the carbon tax before, you're, you're going to like it a lot less going forward because it's going to go up. All right, let's go to Bill in St. Catharines, Ontario. Hello, Bill. Hello, Mark. Hi, Bill. You asked me to call you. Hi, John, Martin. Hi. Hello. Yes, uh, you, you made a prediction about this election, right? Yeah, but this yeah. is only round one. Okay. Round two is coming. But, but remind everybody what your prediction was. I said the Conservative and the, on the sixth day of the election that they were going to win. Yeah. But they didn't. But now, this is only round one. Round okay. two is coming. And because do you think do you think the Conservatives will win election. that time round? There, no, they're going to be another election, one in um, one to two years. Okay. Uh, you had one. You had one caller say about Peter McKay, and he is right, and I agree with him. Get rid of. Um, um, here, people that voted for conservative, they voted for the party, not for him. And uh, why I say uh, uh, it's going to be another election is Trudeau cannot uh, agree with anything with uh, Rob Ford or uh, Jason Kennedy because he ran both of them down in the election. And uh, Ford is the one, really, that screwed Cher up with all his cuts, cuts, cuts. And Trudeau warned the people, said, 
that's how he won. It's because he told he scared the people, saying that if uh, Sher win, you'll be doing a lot of cutting. Yeah. And uh, right. the thing, the thing that's really going to prove is the speech of throne and the budget. Uh, if things are not in that speech of throne or the budget, he is going to uh, they're going to bring him down. And I hope to get rid of Sher and put somebody in there because. Like I said, the people that voted for conservative voted for the party, not for him. All right. Thank you very much for your call. Uh, do we? Is it the next conservative convention where a leadership review will have to take place? Following every uh, following every election, yeah. they have a vote on whether to hold a leadership vote. So as part of the Constitution, they will vote on whether to hold a vote. Right. Uh, and that is part of the Constitution. I believe it's also in the Liberal co Party's co Constitution, mm -hmm. too. Yeah. So it's a mandatory asking you, is it time to re review And the do we know roughly when that is? About Ooh. six months. Yeah. Um, okay. it, the, the last one for the Conservatives was in May in Vancouver, because I was there. Right. Mm -hmm. I, I have to say one thing. One of the things of being out in the ground, on, on, out in the hustings during election, that's fun. Uh, we were in Antigonish in uh, Nova Scotia, and they had the opening of the Mulroney Hall at the uh, St. FX yeah. uh, University. Brian Mulroney was there, Elmer McKay was there, and of course Peter McKay was there, and they were there with their, their celebrity candidate, George Canyon, the country singer. And of course, when you're a journalist, one of the fun things you can do is you can ask very, very inappropriate questions, and I asked Peter McKay, so have you made up your mind? And there was a big Cheshire Cat smile. So there's some things that you can continue to ask questions and not necessarily get an answer. Sure. But it's obviously something that keeps coming up. His name is going to come up a lot, obviously, um, and he is a former party leader, having been the leader of the Progressive Conservatives, although he never contested an election in that role. Um, uh, I would point out one thing, and again, this is going back through the data of Canadian history. Uh, only a couple of times in Canadian history, twice in fact, have uh, Canadians uh, elected a new Prime Minister who had never served in that role before who was older than the prime minister that he was replacing. And uh, that, uh, so there is generational change that happens in Canadian politics. And, and we, we've seen it in this election uh, right away because of the three main party leaders, Justin Trudeau in 2015 was by far the youngest. In this election, he was by far the oldest. Yeah. Both Jagmeet Singh and Andrew Scheer were born in 1980, nine years after, or almost, well, eight yeah. years after uh, Justin Trudeau because he was born in late 1971. Uh, Peter McKay was born in 1965. Uh, history would suggest to us that we might never have another Prime Minister who was born before Justin Trudeau. Uh, and Peter McKay was born before Justin Trudeau. So I put that out there just because it's another interesting fact that Gen generally speaking, yeah. we tend to, to move forward generationally in Canadian politics. Now, as, as, as a counter, I would point to certain geriatric uh, presidents of certain uh, republics that, uh, just south of here. About, we're, not, we're talking about Canada, <laughs> I know, not I know, the United I know. States. It's and a, a different, green population. It is a, it is a different it is. system there that, that, yeah. more, that, uh, under, that produces different exactly. circumstances and outcomes, yeah. uh, obviously. So here's another question just to throw a wrench into it. How old is Jason Kenney? Jason Kenney is, uh, I think he's older than Justin Trudeau. But he, um, I ask that because yeah. I, I really do believe that there are going to be serious tensions in the Federation over the issue of climate change, over the issue of the carbon tax. Yeah. I think um, Jason Albertans, Kenney was born in 1968. Albertans are going to be uh, very angry, um, and, and, Sus and Saskatchewan residents, uh, voters as well, very angry um, if, in fact, the Trans Mountain Pipeline does not proceed. Uh, if uh, the, the Bloc and the NDP are able to force the Liberals to abandon that pipeline, and if the carbon tax goes up, their, essentially their economy uh, will be thrown to the wolves in the effort to fight climate change. In that situation, it would not be inconceivable that Jason Kenney might decide that the best interests of Alberta would be served if he were the leader of the Conservative Party of Canada. Right. And uh, that would be a, an interesting story for him to use as the reason why he's got to run federally so soon after he became the Premier. Right? Exactly so. And yeah. he would be forgiven by every Albertan Conservative sure. that I have talked to have said if Jason Kenney felt he, he needed to run federally to pre represent Alberta interests, uh, we would understand that completely. Yeah. Interesting. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, Martin, you have to go. I, I appreciate go. you joining us. Uh, John, you're going to stay around. 
if you will, if you'll have me. Of course. <laughs> and uh, in the second half, so again, thank you, Martin. My pleasure. Uh, coming up in the rest of our program, we're going to continue to talk about what we, we might see from the federal parties in a new session of Parliament. We want to continue to hear from you. What do you think of last night's election results? And will a Liberal minority government be good for Canada. Call us with your thoughts right now. We do have a couple of lines available. The phone number is 1 877 296 2722. Send us a comment online using hashtag CPAC vote 2019. Let's take a look now at what the leaders said after the votes came in last night. From coast to coast to coast, tonight Canadians rejected division and negativity. They rejected cuts and austerity, and they voted in favour of a progressive agenda and strong action on climate change. I have heard you, my friends. You are sending our Liberal team back to work, back to Ottawa with a clear mandate. We will make life more affordable. We will continue to fight climate change. We will get guns off our streets, and we will keep investing in Canadians. Now, there are still a number of really close races, so we don't know for sure how many more Conservatives Canadians will send to Ottawa tonight. But what we do know is that after the 2015 election, when Justin Trudeau looked unstoppable, when all the pundits and experts said it was the beginning of another Trudeau dynasty, that he would have eight or even 12 years in power. But tonight, Conservatives have put Justin Trudeau on notice. And Mr. Trudeau, when your government falls, Conservatives will be ready and we will win. We have picked up seats and support in almost every region of the country. And at the time I walked onto the stage, we are leading the popular vote, ladies and gentlemen. More Canadians wanted us to win this election than any other party. And remember, remember 2004. In Stephen Harper's first election, he erased Paul Martin's majority and then went on to lead a Conservative government that lasted for nearly 10 years. This is how it starts. This is how it starts. This is the first step. And now we are heading back to Ottawa with a much bigger team, with more support from coast to coast, and with an endorsement from the Canadian people that we are the government in waiting. And friends, in the days ahead, I'll be meeting my new caucus, and we're going to sit together and talk and discuss about how we can deliver for the people of this country. Because the real winner of this election is not a party or a leader. The real winner of any election should always be the people, and that means Canadians. And Canadians, and Canadians sent a pretty clear message, a clear message tonight that they want a government that works for them, not for the rich and the powerful, not for the well-connected. And if, and if, exactly, exactly. And if all MPs, you're right. Oh, I'm sorry. We'll, we'll talk about that. We'll talk. I'm sorry about that. And, and if all MPs elected tonight hear that message and act on that message, then the real winners of this election will be the people. Les Québécois et les Canadiens se donnent ce soir un parlement minoritaire. Aucun parti parmi ceux qui y aspiraient, n'a obtenu une majorité de sièges. Aucun parti ce soir ne prend le contrôle de la Chambre des communes. Au Québec, le Bloc québécois ne veut pas former un gouvernement, ni même participer à un gouvernement. En revanche, le Bloc québécois peut, au mérite, collaborer avec n'importe quel gouvernement. Si, si ce qui est proposé est bon pour le Québec, vous pourrez compter sur nous. 
Si ce qui est mis de l'avant est nuisible pour le Québec, le Bloc se dressera sur le chemin. Si le gouvernement est parlable, il est dans le tempérament même des Québécois d'être parlable, alors le Bloc québécois sera parlable. Sauf, sauf s'il s'agit de passer davantage de pétrole à travers le Québec. Sauf s'il s'agit de renoncer ou compromettre des valeurs, notre langue ou l'engagement du Québec envers la laïcité des institutions publiques. Je ne crois pas que les Québécois et les Canadiens aient élu un gouvernement minoritaire dans le but de retourner aux urnes dans 18 mois ou dans deux ans et demi. Je crois que les Québécois et les Canadiens nous demandent, tout parti, et toutes régions confondues, malgré les divisions profondes qui marquent la carte politique du Canada aujourd'hui, ils nous demandent de travailler ensemble. I stood on a stage in Victoria, September 11th, and I saw the school climate strikers in front of me. I saw Emma Jane, I saw Emma, uh, and I saw Rebecca, and I said, jump up on stage with me. So if you see some, some teary faces up here, this was a children's crusade. And I vow not to let them down, because what they just said to me was they feel as though what happened doesn't Canada care about our future. And what I want them to know and what I want all Canadians to know is that I think and I know in my heart that all Canadians do care about the future. They care about the climate crisis. And to those leaders who told them, and I'm speaking, of course, to Prime Minister Trudeau and to Mr. Singh, who said they had a plan for climate that would protect our children's future while not having one. We go to Parliament determined to ensure that you actually have one while we still have the chance before the window on 1.5 degrees Celsius global average temperature increase closes for good. We will not allow the Parliament of Canada in its 43rd session to let down our children. En droit à chier. I want to congratulate the new MP for both. My heart goes out to our 315 candidates across the country. Yeah. They, they shown extraordinary courage and passion in defending our principles and policies. They did it despite nasty and shameless attacks from our opponents. They made huge personal sacrifice to offer voters a principal alternative different from that of all the other parties. But what they did was not in vain. What we managed to accomplish in only one year is spectacular. That's what the major party leaders were saying after the election results became known last night. Now it's time once again for you to have your say. Welcome back to our program. We're continuing to look now at what might arise out of yesterday's election. And our question to you is this, will a liberal minority government be good for Canada? Please call us now at 1-877-296-2722 or tweet us at CPAC underscore TV. You can also email us at haveyoursay at cpac.ca. John Ibbotson from the Globe and Mail continues with us this hour. And joining us for our discussion are Mehdi Bouchentouf, a political science student at Carleton University, Ariana Coleman, a public affairs and policy management student from Carleton, and Leslie Mayhew, who is studying political science and public administration at the University of Ottawa. Welcome to all of you. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Let's get a quick reaction from each of you on the election results. Leslie, what did you think? I kind of expected it. Like, right from the beginning, I just had this sense that no one was going to be able to really come together to get a majority. 
that wasn't going to be possible. I didn't know if it was going to be conservative or liberal because there was a strong leaning in both as far as my own friend circles or personal relations are concerned. Um, I'm not really surprised. Okay, Ariana? Yeah, I think definitely considering that the popular vote went conservative but then the electoral vote went liberal, um, it made it very clear that there was definitely a huge divide and that national unity is becoming increasingly more important. Um, so I think that the question of whether it's a good government is for whom. Mm -hmm. Maddie? Um, I felt that was expected. I think it was again 50-50 between like, like a liberal minority or, or conservative minority, but I think most people went into it thinking, you know, this is going to be a minority government. Um, I think at that point it was really interesting to see how the bloc gained in Quebec and, and how Ontario and Quebec just generally went, because I think most of kind of the West went uh, the conservative way. So I think it's going to be interesting to see how government functions, but I think I don't think anybody's going to be extremely surprised of the result. Yeah. Was this the first election in which each of you could vote? Is that second. the case? This was your second? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so for you, what was the experience? What was the experience of watching an election different because you had a stake in it? Yeah, certainly. I think so. I was able to vote in the provincial um, election last year, so that was kind of my first taste of doing it. And just the amount of investment I think that people our age are starting to have in federal politics is really interesting. And just seeing more, um, even on social media, people are interacting with uh, their local MPs and are more involved in the process overall, which I think is amazing. Yeah, Mehdi, for you, what was the what was it like? For me, this is technically my second federal election. I was able to vote in the uh, Ottawa Vanier by election. Unfortunately, due to Mr. Right. Belanger's passing away, um, but I thought it was pretty interesting to see to be able to vote in like something where there's like more of a national campaign. For me, it was very targeted yeah. within Ottawa Vanier, so it was very different for me. John, uh, we should talk about voter turnout. It was down from 2015, uh, but uh, but not by much. Uh, oh. And there were people who thought it would be down more than that. Uh, 2015 was a big bump from the previous couple of elections. So uh, it was still this the voter turnout this time around was about 66 percent, which was still higher than the the 2011 and 2008 elections. And it's encouraging um, in this way. So yes, uh, generally speaking, turnout had been declining since the 1980s yeah. um, in Canadian elections, and it gotten to around 60 percent um, in the last decade. Um, it was, I believe, 60 61 percent in the 2011 election that produced a conservative majority government. But then it shot up eight percentage points um, of to levels we have not seen since the early 1990s for Justin Trudeau. So the question was, would those voters, and they were young voters, we know that because Elections Canada did a study on it, would those young voters who turned out in record numbers uh, to support Justin Trudeau uh, stay away because they were disillusioned with some of the stumbles of the government, or would they come out um, and vote again? Well, at 66 percent, it suggests that a lot of them came out to vote again. And it is good news, again, I refer to this essay that I wrote um, in the Globe uh, that, that appeared over the weekend. I talked about three cleavages that were emerging as a result of this election campaign. The cleavage between Quebec and English Canada, mm -hmm. and the cleavage uh, between Western Canada and Central Canada. But I also talked about a cleavage between younger voters and older voters. Younger voters who are more progressive, more concerned about uh, environmental issues. Um, and older voters who tended to be more conservative and more focused on pocketbook issues. Well, yes, the conservatives did beat the liberals um, in terms of, of popular vote, but overall, progressive parties um, uh, did very well collectively, and the turnout suggests that younger voters uh, did not abandon the system. They came out to make their views known, and that's encouraging. Yeah. Uh, one uh, stat that, uh, as I was, I was looking up the uh, the voter turnout, you were right, it was 61% in 2011, 68% uh, in 2015, 66% this time around. Uh, I'm just noticing as well that Justin, Justin Trudeau and the Liberals attracted 6.9 million total votes in 2015, 5.9 million votes in 2019. So they're, the Liberals' vote total dropped by a, a million mm -hmm. votes. So at least a million Canadians who voted for the Liberals in 2015 did not vote for them this time around. And that's not even taking into account the fact that some of the 5.9 million who voted for them this time around may have been people who didn't vote in the mm -hmm. last election. And some of them will be people who didn't vote, and others will be people who voted for the Bloc Québécois in Quebec, yeah. um, uh, or even the Green Party, which saw its vote, I believe, go up from 3% to 6%. Yeah. How do you think, uh, Ariana, Justin Trudeau is viewed among young people in this country? Uh, because young people were a big part of how mm -hmm. he got elected four years ago. Yeah, for sure. I definitely think that there's been more of a push towards kind of the NDP. Jagmeet Singh has been a candidate that's been really appealing to younger voters. Um, I just think that 
Um, he's appealing due to the fact that he kind of pushes for things that a lot of students and younger people would like to see. Um, so his pharmacare kind of stance as well as his position on education um, and then just his diversity and inclusion mantra has been very appreciated by young people in a way I think is definitely different than older generations. Mehdi, what do you think? Yeah, I think honestly after the past four years, I think we had a more holistic idea of what Trudeau is and I think we have an idea now of what what the priorities were in the past government, especially being a majority government. And I think at that point we necessarily saw the fact that it wasn't aligned as much as we would have liked with our youth interests. I think there was a balance between kind of middle class, older ba issues, and I think most people kind of, most youth kind of went to the NDP and kind of saw them as the youth party. Um, and it's gonna be really interesting to see how both parties kind of work out and hopefully, hopefully the fact that it's a minority government, you'll see more push for youth issues to be addressed, especially if uh, the NDP decides to support the Liberals. Yeah, issues like what? Um, I think the, fa the uh, debt when it comes to like interest interest for example when it comes to loans like student debt is very large it's, it's really in, it incapacitates you to like contribute within the economy you don't have the ability to do that when you have to pay back your loan so I think one of the biggest issues that I've brought up is like corporate subsidies versus like you know helping us kind of bring down our debt and I think that's a huge issue that was brought up and I think hopefully that's something that we're able to get some help on because interest interest is very high for, for students when you get out of school and don't have access to positions that you would otherwise like to have. Leslie, what drove your vote ultimately? What were the issues that were most important to you? I really wanted to, not just for myself, but encourage other people to vote based on values more so than necessarily thinking of strategic voting. I think that that was definitely something that came into play with the 2015 election. And so that's where you know the NDP did get lifted up a little to a certain extent because people didn't want the conservative government coming back in. Um, this time around, I think it was very similar in the sense that people were afraid that Andrew Scheer would get into power and that came with a whole prolific feeling or this sense of it's going to turn into a Kenny, it's going to turn into a Doug Ford looking at provincial levels and people in Ontario definitely resonated with that because there's definitely been certain cuts that affected education, um, me medical uh, services to say autism families who were affected by these things. And so I think on a, a more federal level, people were aware of the sense that conservative doesn't necessarily guarantee or it rather it, it guarantees um, working on the deficit and trying to, to work on removing certain services. but a question of what services were going to be taken away from people. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people and young people um, wanted to focus on that, really. Ariana, what were you hearing from amongst your peers uh, about the important issues to them in this campaign? Certainly. I definitely think that there's a little bit of a disconnect, honestly, between um, younger voters and older voters in terms of how they th thought the election was going to pan out. I knew lots of people who maybe don't have as much of a political background who were sure that the NDP would make great gains and would do really well and stuff like that without kind of understanding from a holistic view the other, you know, different demo demographics that are at play who also have the right to vote. So I think that's been really interesting. Um, in terms of issues that are at hand, again, I think that the diversity and inclusion one is very um, strong, especially within in the case of Bill 21, having that be a whole topic during the English language debate and being touched on so frequently, even though it's a provincial thing, is really interesting. Yeah, I think that was why Bloc did so well mm -hmm. and why maybe Trudeau lost some uh, place in Quebec because mm -hmm. of encroaching on provincial levels, right? Mm -hmm. All right, very interesting to hear your comments. Let's turn back to our viewing audience and hear from some of them. Wayne in Chatham, Ontario. Wayne, go ahead. Huh? Hi there. Hi. Hi there. How are you? Good, thank you. Good. Um, the election, well, it wasn't really much of a surprise anyways, uh, but the best part of, of the whole 2019 election is the fact that Jody Wilson-Raybould won her seat as an independent. And that is brilliant because it showed the voters knew what to do. They wanted to reward honesty, integrity, trust. And the fact, I don't think it mattered whether or not she was uh, uh, heritage from Native Canadian or not. Um, it's basically, she should be on a $10 bill now in Canada <laughs> just for fighting for her rights, just getting right up there. And honesty is, is the best policy, regardless, right or wrong, uh, whether it's in the eyes of others or not. She was wonderful. She did not... Uh, diss anybody she just said I'm gonna work as an intermediator 
between everyone. I think that's beautiful. And that right. uh, showed honesty basically for, uh, let's say, for young people, for old people. That's something rare in politics, is an honest politician. And, you know, we're so lucky in Canada here to have somebody like that, an honest politician. I think that's wonderful. All right, Wayne, thank you very much for your call. Now, John, uh, uh, of course, there were a lot of Canadians who didn't get to vote in Vancouver Granville who would have been cheering on Jody Wilson-Raybould and hoping that she did win. Um, and I don't want to be cynical about this, but in the end, uh, what does that mean in terms of the Parliament moving forward? She's, she's only one vote. It's not a vote that's needed for any legislation to pass. Uh, so... Uh, and we've seen historically in the past how independent MPs often disappear into the woodwork. On yeah, Parliament and Hill. that may well be the case here too, I'm afraid. I think there are also people who were sad that Jane Philpott, um, yep. who left and also ran as an independent in solidarity uh, with Ms. wilson Rebel, didn't uh, prevail um, in her Ontario riding. But uh, Jody wilson Rebel is formidably talented. She's going to discover that she doesn't get to ask questions in the House of Commons, almost never. The Speaker may, you know, once in a blue moon, um, uh, recognize her and allow her to ask a question. Mm -hmm. She's not going to be on parliamentary committees. She's not going to be able to argue things in caucus. Um, if um, she decided by the time of the next election in two or three years uh, that she wanted to move on, this would not surprise me in the least. No, it may well be that she discovers that she loves the life of an independent yep. backbencher. There are <laughs> independent MPs who have who've been in the Parliament for, through many sessions, and she may become one of them. But somehow, I don't think backbench, uh, independent backbench MP is the last thing that's going to be on Jody Wilson-Raybould's uh, Wilson resume. Uh, yeah, I doubt that. Uh, but I, I wonder how much we'll hear about her and hear from her just because of the nature of, of how Parliament is is structured and covered uh, in the next year or two. Yeah, I mean, even uh, Elizabeth May, when she was a, a lone voice in the House, she represented a political party. Yeah. When Deb Gray was a lone voice in the House, she was the, the only person representing the Reform Party. The party was out there, even if there was only one MP in the House. There's no one that Ms. Wilson-Raybould officially represents. Uh, obviously, she's going to speak on Indigenous issues, but um, there's no party infrastructure for her to be the mm -hmm. voice of. All right, let's take a call from Ellen in Barrie, Ontario. Hello, Ellen. Hello. Hi, go ahead. Well, the first thing I want to say to these young people that are on your panel there that were scared of Sear, uh, Andrew Sear because he might cut some of their privilege handouts, by the time they reach middle age, they'll be paying for Trudeau's bills. Just tell them that. And and uh, I don't think there's an order. <laughs> I don't think this American, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this Trudeau minority is going to last very long because both leaders hate each other, and I don't blame Scheer for hating Trudeau because of the way he treated Alberta. So I don't think it's going to last too long. Well, it's not up to Andrew Scheer, really, uh, whether this no, government lasts very long. No, I know it's not up long. to him, but uh, they'll be fighting. Trudeau's too arrogant to get along with anybody. He's too arrogant. He'll never get along with anybody. Okay. That's why I don't think it'll last long. All right, Ellen, thank you for your call. James in Guelph, Ontario. Hello, James. Hi, James. Hi there. Go ahead. So with the election, we've seen that the Conservatives winning the popular vote, the NDP receiving almost twice the votes of the Bloc Québécois and not quite receiving as much uh, representation in the House, is it maybe time to revive BC's experiment with single transferable vote? and the election reform campaign that uh, Trudeau had run on in 2015. Yeah, now those are two different questions, uh, because uh, on the one hand you're asking, is it time to revisit electoral reform? And on the other hand, you're asking, is it time to revisit a very specific form of, of electing governments? Um, I'm, I'm not sure if a single transferable vote would have produced a different outcome vis-a-vis -vis the bloc and the NDP, just because of the fact that the reason the bloc gets so many seats with so few votes is they're only running in a small number of ridings compared to the NDP, right? That's not going to change. Fair, yeah. yeah. Uh, but uh, I didn't hear a lot of talk of electoral reform during this campaign or last night, even, even with what some people may perceive as an injustice in some of the results. So, John, do you think we'll be talking about that? Or will the next election also be run under the first-past-the-post system? Uh, if I had to put my, any money on it, I would say we'll be with first-past-the-post for quite some time. It might have been in the interest of the NDP, certainly would have been in the interest of the Green, to make any support um, 
in the future going yep. forward contingent on forcing the liberals to live up to the promise that they made in 2015 and then broke because mm -hmm. they were the ones who said that would be the very yep. last election that was done with first past the post but when the committee recommended proportional representation the liberals said uh, not so much. Yeah, they lost and, interest. And by the way, um, they were smart to do that because they lost <laughs> the popular vote in this mm -hmm. election. Yeah. So you could have seen a scenario in which the Jagmeet Singh um, said, you don't get my vote on anything until proportional representation is your first bill. But then uh, the Liberals just go to the Conservatives. Uh, or in this case, go to the Bloc Quebecois because mm -hmm. it's not in the interest of the Bloc yeah. to move to PR. So I think PR is a dead issue at the federal level for a while. Yeah, it is interesting though that if the Conservatives had gotten behind some form of electoral reform uh, like proportional representation, they uh, might have been better off this time around. They, I don't think they anticipated that. And having said all of that, of course, when you change the rules, you change the behavior and the outcome. So we can't just say the election would have been the same with the same people voting for the same parties mm -hmm. if the rules were different, right? Yeah, but, um, but most conservative strategists are aware that there are in the universe more progressive than conservative voters yeah. in Canada. And it tends to, yeah, it propor proportional representation is not going to work in their favor in the long run. Uh, Peter is in Strathmore, Alberta. Hello, Peter. Hi, how are you today? Good, thank you. Just a couple quick questions. Uh, the first one is I think we should uh, change our seating throughout Canada to make it more even for Western Canada because out here we're just flipping out. And question two, we'll never get another pipeline in Canada because we know the bloc isn't going to let it happen. We know the NDP isn't going to happen and the Liberals aren't going to happen. So in the West we're still screwed no matter what, minority or majority. I, I just don't understand. Yeah. Um, uh, John, just on that, uh, what happens with the Trans Mountain Pipeline now? We, the Government of Canada owns it, of course, so yeah. something has to be done with it. It's in jeopardy. There's no question about that. Um, now, the Liberal government owns it. Well, the Government of Canada owns it. <laughs> yeah. um, construction is underway. Uh, at the moment, there are no injunctions uh, against it. There will be Indigenous and environmental protests. Um, you can count on that uh, once construction gets underway. Um, in this, uh, for, you know, seriously gets underway in the spring. Um, the Liberals can carry on with Trans Mountain so long as they don't mention it and the Bloc and the NDP don't make it um, an election defining issue. Right. Uh, now, at that point, they can always go to the Conservatives and ask for Conservative yep. support. But does it, it need to be supported in the House of Commons? or it, At the moment, no. Yeah. It, as long as nothing happens, uh, it, can, it can carry right. on. It would require the opposition parties to make it an issue and say, we will not vote for your budget unless funding for the Trans Mountain Pipeline is cut. Um, and at that point, things could get uh, a bit dicey. So if, if, in fact, Mr. Trudeau found that, say, the budget's coming up, uh, Jagmeet Singh says, no Trans Mountain funding or we vote against the budget. And um, the Bloc says uh, no Trans Mountain funding or we vote against the budget. And the Conservatives say we're just going to vote against you anyway because we don't like you. <laughs> um, then it would be um, properly politically astute for the Liberals to cut funding for the Trans Mountain mm. pipeline. But if they did that, the rage in the West would be severe. Yeah. That could get interesting. Robert in Windsor, Ontario. Hello, Robert. Hi, Robert. Paul. Go ahead. Uh, this morning when I woke up, I saw Trudeau dancing and celebrating. Now, what was he celebrating? No, he did win a minority government, but he lost in everything else. Every other place he lost. And I heard his opening remarks of the speech. And how can Canadians trust this guy when he opens with a speech from coast to coast to coast to coast to coast, Canadians have decided. Now, Alberta doesn't have a coastline, so are you not calling them as Canadians? Well, I, I think, look, uh, let's, let's not parse words here. I, I think when you say from coast to coast to coast in Canada, you're including everything between the coasts. You're not saying only the provinces that have coastline. Exactly. So when that's not true, because the Western provinces didn't decide on what we are saying. And then the next thing is, I just came up, I was looking, I was doing some research, and I came across a, a 
I came across an article in from the Calgary Herald from 3rd of October, and it tells me that the deficit is rising by $2.26 million a day, which is about $54 million a month. And you multiply that by 365, or no, uh, 12, and then multiply by another four, four years of Trudeau's government, plus add another $80 billion to the deficit. My grandkids will have nothing, or my kids, maybe my kids will get older. They won't have any health care. They won't have nothing. And since 1990, the, the, the interest paid is $988. Could you imagine if Canada had that money to spend on its citizens? Where would we be? Okay, thank you very much for your call. Richard in Vancouver. Hello, Richard. Hi, how are you? <clears throat> Hello. Go ahead. Hi, first off, uh, being from BC, um, we won't let the pipeline happen. I know that's not going to happen, and it needs to not happen. But that being said, they need to stop ignoring these people in Alberta, and they need to do something to help them out and transition and take their skills and that workforce and put them to work and not forget about them like he did. And I don't blame them for not voting in Trudeau, but <laughs> I can't believe Sheer got that many votes. That man is not a, an adult. He's a tattletaler. He just stands there and says the same thing over and over and over and over again. Trudeau is a lying, uh, arrogant uh, child. Actually, I wouldn't even insult children by calling him a child. He's, I don't know what he is. But watching this election was almost embarrassing because these did not seem like responsible, mature adults that should be leading the country. Okay, Richard, thank you for your call. We're also getting lots of emails. Again, the email address is haveyoursay at cpac.ca. We welcome your comments at any time. Let's take a look at some of the emails that we have received. Bob writes, with no Liberal elected from Winnipeg to Vancouver, I think it is time for Canada to break into two. The East and West are wanting to go in two different directions, and I don't see this ever changing. Nick writes, the key political issue is allowing all members of Parliament to have their say, so they can represent their constituents. However, the only party leader that said he would enable every member of the, his caucus to speak for their constituents was Yves-François Blanchet of the Bloc. It is not surprising that the Bloc did so well in this election. Sabrina writes, with all the scandals and massive spending us into debt, how is this a good thing? He's already taxing the middle class he promised to help. It's all empty promises to get votes to keep his cushy job, to keep his paycheck in the bank and live off the taxpayers. The amount of seats the prairies have is not even fair. We can't change anything, so I hope the West separates. Bruno writes, it will work because NDP will be supportive and Bloc Québécois seem not to be a showstopper. Conservatives won't be a problem because they are going to face a leadership battle for sure. And Gary writes, the minority government may work until the public wakes up and realizes that all the promises given to them have to be funded out of their own wallets. When the NDP ask for some astronomical amount of money to finance one of their programs and Justin Trudeau has to tell them we just don't have the money for that program, then all hell will break loose and we will have another election. We've had a couple of people, John, raise the issue of uh, fairness when it comes to the number of seats in Alberta and Saskatchewan in Western Canada generally. Uh, of course, uh, it is to some extent based on population in this country. There are, of course, ridings that have smaller populations and ridings that have larger populations. But is it, is it unfair that the West doesn't have more seats? It is regrettable that the West doesn't have more seats. Um, the one time uh, in my adult life that um, w worries about separatism, worries about Western alienation uh, disappeared uh, over the horizon was when Stephen Harper was in power. Now, that doesn't mean that Stephen Harper was some kind of great statesman. It meant that you had a coalition of suburban voters in Ontario and voters in the West who sustained a conservative government. That was a good, healthy um, kind of coalition to have. It would have been better if it had some seats in Quebec, more seats in Quebec as well, but at least you didn't have um, the sense of Western alienation, and you didn't have Quebec alienation either because the conservative government in Ottawa 
did not try to interfere in Quebec's jurisdiction. Now you have a government that does like to interfere in provincial jurisdictions, that likes to impose carbon taxes on provinces that, that don't go along uh, with the global warming plans, that likes to dictate health care, uh, that likes to dictate uh, on, a, on a variety of social issues. Um, and you are seeing, well, guess what? You are seeing the revival of the, the Bloc Québécois in Quebec. You are seeing talk of Western separatism in the West. It is not good for the country. Rep by pop I is what it is. Uh, there are more voters in Ontario than there are in Alberta, so Ontario sends more seats. But you do not want to live in a, in a federation in which parts of the federation feel that they're being completely estranged from the rest of the country. And this is one of the reasons why when people talk about shutting down pipelines, about fighting climate change by leaving the oil in the ground, it makes people so angry. I talked to Brad Wall, the former Premier of Saskatchewan. Mr. Wall said, imagine if the government said that in order to meet our Paris targets, in order to meet our 2030 targets, that we were going to have to shut down manufacturing in Ontario and Quebec. That the Ontario automobile industry would simply have to be restricted right. and then wound down. And that the aviation industry in Quebec would have to be terminated. It's going to cost hundreds of thousands of jobs and it's going to cost many billions of dollars and it will destroy the economy. But look, it's a climate crisis. What are you going to do? That would not happen. It would not be tolerated. But we tolerate the same uh, when, we, when we say, well, we can't build any more pipelines. Yeah. We can't take oil out of the ground in Alberta. Albertans and Saskatchewans, Saskatchewaners, when they hear that, feel exactly the way Ontarians and Quebecers would feel if they were being told that their economy had to be destroyed in order to meet Paris climate targets. Mm. Good points. All right, Nicholas is in St. Andrews, Ontario. Hello, Nicholas. Thanks for taking my call. Um, the question, I, th I believe, was uh, will, the, uh, will the, the, the uh, minority government be good for Canada? Yes. Um, no normally, minor minority governments, I think, are pretty good for uh, the countries uh, where they uh, exist. Uh, but unfortunately, I don't think this one is going to work because of the divisiveness within the country. And I think that uh, Justin Trudeau doesn't have the character and the ability to actually um, unify this country. I think it needs somebody else. Um, and uh, going, um, something uh, from your, the last hour, you, um, I would like to sort of mention uh, you know, one of the people who phoned in mentioned Pierre Polyev as uh, should be the leader of the Conservative Party. I mentioned him to you on, on one of your shows two or three weeks ago that I thought he was uh, the man to do the job. He reminded me of Winston Churchill and uh, because of his oratory, his manner mannerisms, and he has a killer instinct. So I think he's one candidate that should certainly be considered. Uh, and the other one would be Candice Bergen, because she also has that killer instinct. Because um, uh, with um, Andrew Shear, I think, I, I like the guy. I like Andrew Shear, but he doesn't have that killer instinct. He's too much of a Mr. Nice Guy. But what I would like to hear from your panel, your young panel and younger panel, <laughs> um, is... Uh, John is very grateful for that Yes, thank comment. you for that. I pre <laughs> truly yeah. appreciate it. Is what, what, um, what their thoughts are on having, say, Candice Bergen um, running as leader of the, of the Conservative Party, being a female, and do you think, do they, would they think it would garner more, uh, bigger votes, more votes um, in, uh, in, in the country and maybe even uh, get more people out to vote? Right. Okay. So it would be interesting to hear comments on that. Yeah. Thank you very much for your call. Um, I would point out that I think, you know, when, whenever we talk about uh, hypothetical situations, uh, you talk about uh, just what that leader represents. Uh, it's a woman, it's a visible minority, it's not, it's a certain somebody from a certain age group, uh, it's somebody with a certain profile. But it, it, when leaders actually run in campaigns, they're, it's not just about who they are, right? People don't just say, well, I'm going to vote for her because she's a woman. It's about their policies, how they've performed on the campaign, the issues that have come up over the course of the campaign. So when you play this game, you have to acknowledge that, I think. But having said that, uh, are there future political leaders, Leslie, that you think would attract more votes to the Conservative Party? We were actually just talking about this earlier, and it was pretty funny that you mentioned Jody Wilson-Raybould, and everyone is also thinking of that as well. Right. As an independent player, she does play potential significant future roles when it comes to, say, the Conservative Party. She certainly has different aspects of her portfolio that 
could perhaps align with their views. And if she were to say, cross the line or cross the floor, go over onto mm -hmm. that side, I think as an indigenous woman with visible minority representation, not just being a woman as well, but her portfolio and the merit of her, her position and what she's played already, I think she could be a pretty significant player if she decided to do that. Okay. Ariana, any thoughts? Yeah, I definitely think that identity politics has been something that's increasingly more talked about. Um, and I do think that it would make it interesting, I think, for maybe younger voters who are women to think about who might have the chance to be electing the first, well, by election and properly, I right. guess, um, uh, you know, Prime Minister of Canada as a woman. Um, that being said, I don't think it would be maybe influential enough to drastically change the kind of uh, layout of our party politics and stuff, but it would definitely be interesting to see. Yeah. Mehdi, is there a, is there a future leader out there that you're hoping will emerge on the scene in Canadian politics, regardless um, of the party? Well, specifically for the Conservatives, I think when I think of what their future leadership should be, I think Rona Ambrose, I think Michael Chong, I think those are the two people that, at least for me, I'd, I, I don't consider myself to be conservative in any way, but if I chose to vote conservative, I think I would go towards someone who's more of a red Tory. I think Rona Ambrose, having been in cabinet, having been the environment minister, also being from Alberta, I think would have some of that representation that's needed there. So those are the two that, in my view, would be good leaders. Do I think that that's where the party's going? I'm not sure. I'm, I'm kind of opposed to Pierre Poilievre as the leader just because he serves as like more of like an attack dog within the House of Commons, and I think that's not the direction the, cons the Conservatives should go in. So Rona Ambrose and Michael Chong are the two that I would like to see lead mm. the Conservatives. Of course, Michael Chong did run in the last yes. leadership mm -hmm. campaign and, um, <coughs> and, and finished very poorly, yeah. so the, the Conservative base had its say. And he, I'll, I'll confess something here. This is what has me walking around the block uh, and around the block and around the block with the dog wondering when we're finally going to go home. I agree that the Conservative Party must expand beyond its base. Um, that white, rural, um, low tax, um, maybe not so uh, welcoming to immigrants, maybe not so tolerant on issues of abortion uh, and on LGBTQ rights. Um, and to the extent that the party stays there, it gets about a third of the vote and never grows uh, anywhere past that. Just happened again this time. Yeah. So. Let us say we need someone who will grow the Conservative Party past that base uh, and, uh, and attract younger voters, attract uh, immigrant mm -hmm. voters, attract uh, suburban voters in Ontario. What then happens to the base? I mean, one of the great n events of this election was that the uh, People's Party, Maxine Bernier's party, got, I think, 1.6% of the vote. That's right. Whatever Andrew Scheer did, he managed to marginalize the extreme right uh, in Canada, the, 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 the part that says we don't want immigrants, we don't want multiculturalism, we think uh, climate change is a Chinese hoax, they were rendered insignific insignificant. If you move the Conservative Party in the direction that some people are talking about moving it, do you then afford a space for an anti-immigrant party, mm -hmm. a populist, right-wing, intolerant, anti-climate change um, party that could garner what, 5% of the vote, 10% of the vote, that could have party standing in the House of Commons, mm. just as we have seen in the United States with Donald Trump uh, and with the rise of nativist anti-immigrant parties throughout Europe. That door opens, and I don't have a solution to this, but I'd want to know how do you broaden the base of conservatism in Canada without opening uh, the floodgates to the creation of an anti-immigrant populist party. So how did Brian Mulroney do it? Or was would, did, did that faction not exist in, uh, in as large a quantity as uh, in the 1980s? He didn't do it. Uh, by the time he had finished uh, his second term, the Bloc Québécois had, had split uh, off from his Quebec caucus well, and I, the Reform Party yeah. uh, was about to destroy the Conservative Party in Western Canada. But he did it for several years. He, he won two elections sure, by from substantial con majorities. From Confederation up until the 1980s, the two big brokerage parties were able to contain within them all sorts of different elements right. and say to them, there are only two parties that matter, the NDP was never going to go anywhere, you have to be a liberal or you have to be a conservative or you will never gain power. But that formula uh, was shattered in the 1993 election when we discovered that regional parties, grievance parties um, could in fact uh, garner enough support to have significant representation in the House of Commons. And it just happened again yesterday with the return of the bloc. It could happen again um, with, 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 uh, with the rise of, uh, of anger in the West. I don't have a solution to this. I just don't know what you do about it. 
Yeah, that's an interesting point. It does raise the question for me uh, about whether or not, um, if Maxime Bernier wants to keep the People's Party of Canada alive, uh, should he move to Alberta? <laughs> I think the party, if, if and when, the party that I'm talking about, a uh, party like Alternative for Germany, the Sweden Democrats, mm -hmm. uh, the Brexiters in the UK, uh, the, 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 the people who turn out at Donald Trump uh, rallies in the United States. If that party emerges in Canada, I don't want to see it happen. But if it happens, it won't be a Maxine Bernier that leads it. Right. Um, it'll, it'll be someone who is more genuinely populist and popular. All right, let's take a call from Jeff in Berks Falls, Ontario. Hello, Jeff. Hi, my right, name is ahead. Bill. It's not Jeff, but that's okay. What is I it? Sorry? It's Bill? It's Bill. Okay. Yes. Bill, the reason go I'm ahead. The reason I'm calling it was the fact that, uh, um, to me, this election, I'm 69 years of age, was probably, I felt, the worst. Meaning, only meaning on the sense of when you asked a question about the election, the amount of drama and the amount of, of lies that went out there. I watched, you guys played uh, the speeches right after each, uh, after the election was over. And Andrew Scheer mentioned, not the Liberal Party, he mentioned... Um, Justin, I don't know how many times. I looked at Justin, never mentioned Andrew Scheer. I looked at Mr. Singh, never mentioned Andrew Scheer. And I thought to myself, and the block never mentioned um, Justin or any of the other people. I think this election to me really brought out a lot of, um, um, I want to say, deceit. And I think that was hurting. And if I think Andrew Scheer had have stayed off a lot of that, they wouldn't have turned around. And younger people, probably, we, wouldn't have, we would have been able to see a better choice of parties, not the people. And one of the biggest things I wanted to ask you guys was the fact that on the media, because I followed it a lot, on the media, when it came to the uh, Ray Barnes issue, the first thing Ms. Ray Bourne had said when she made her first television appearance was he didn't break the law, okay? The just, I looked at Justin Trudeau as a CEO, and if he can't approach his directors to inquire, okay, what do you need in this area, or what's going on in this area, um, that doesn't put any leader in any good spot, like when the ethics said he shouldn't even have spoke to him. And I really do think that... But let's, let me jump in here, Bill, because uh, you're comparing Justin Trudeau to a CEO. CEOs are not responsible for the justice system in Canada. Uh, if they were, then probably there would be fewer prosecutions of companies for bad behavior, right? So we, we're supposed to have an independent justice system that is free of politics. In your analogy, that doesn't allow for that. Okay, if I take out the word CEO and just take out a leader, okay, a leader is still ahead of uh, um, different departments and different things like this here. And I'm only going by what Ms. Raybarn had said. Okay, she might have felt uncomfortable, and I was trying to well, use that analogy to compare for the average person. She's a, she didn't, she didn't, she may have said that, what he, that he didn't break the law, but she didn't say what he did wasn't wrong, or we wouldn't have been in this situation, right? So. Uh, you, I, 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 you're, I can live with that. You're, you're, with that. you're portraying it as though Justin Trudeau did nothing wrong because he's just a leader ordering his team around. Uh, but Jody, that's not what Jody Wilson Raybould was saying. Okay. Well, I, I, can, I can live with that. I okay. actually just took it, took it, and I was using sure. that as a layman. I want to bring it back to the the election, though. Yes. Uh, yes. So just give us some I final really thoughts believe, on that. And that's okay. I really believe if I really do believe if that they had stayed away from a lot of the dirty play and things like this here um, because just even up before the day I went out to make my vote okay it was still um, the lying and, and that was brought up if they stayed away from all of that stuff I think the conservatives in all fairness because there's a lot of great conservative leaders that were out there from provincial from um, the Davis era to um, uh, and, and, so and are you saying the conservatives should have taken a higher road basically and a little bit more of a yeah. higher ethic role on the sense of staying away from uh, the mudslinging. That's right. The okay. Word that was Fair enough, for. Bill. Thank you for your call. Ashley in St. Catharines, Ontario. Hello, Ashley. Hi. Um, I just wanted to speak to the two issues that were brought up by the um, two previous callers. One about the divisiveness about this campaign and really where our country is left off. It really struck me when 
Justin Trudeau went and spoke at the exact same time as Andrew Scheer, it kind of seems that there's still going to be animosity built up from this election. I don't see Justin Trudeau having the character to resolve this issue. But also, I find it a sad day in Canadian history when a you know, liberal character like Justin Trudeau has essentially been reelected. The idea that he interfered with the court proceeding, doesn't seem to believe in individual liberty, and now he governs with a mandate that doesn't have the majority of the popular vote. It just seems very questionable, his leadership, in my opinion, and I'm worried about where our country is going to go in the next two years. Okay, thank you for your call. Linda in Calgary, go ahead. Hello, Linda. I just wanted to, to quickly um, let you know that I was listening to BNN, and Tara Weber had said that um, it was 5,000 and change registered with for Wexit, and since the election ended, it's up to 154,000. So that's how much alienation has grown overnight. And um, the website, when it hit 154,000, it went down because it was too many hits at one time. And um, I don't think people understand. There's 428,000 people employed in the oil industry. 10% of those jobs belong to indigenous people. So um, it's not just picking on Alberta as such. 10% of the, uh, the people working there, um, the Indigenous is just as upset. So okay. I, I, quite frankly, I think it's a good thing that the country is going to split up. Okay. Because um, my last little quick comment is to hear that young lady suggest that um, Doug Ford is making cuts. He's not making cuts. They're living on credit. He's trying to curb the debt. And for some reason, the people in Eastern Canada don't understand that that's money they owe. Each, each individual person, even a small child, owe $42,000 before the next budget. That's, and they're saying he's making cuts. Well, yeah, because they have to pay interest on that money. So math is clearly not taught in school yeah. anymore. Okay. And I'll leave it at that and I'll go. All right. Thank you very much, Linda. I appreciate your call. I uh, want to hear from very quickly from each of our panelists on what you'll be watching for uh, in the days ahead. Uh, what, what's going to be important for you as you see this new government evolve? Well, first, I love how everyone jumped on the I'm all about these cuts and <laughs> that the deficit isn't important. Um, and I clearly don't math. Uh, that aside, I'm talking for the general sentiment of a lot of sure. my friends. And for myself, this divisiveness that a lot of people have been talking about, um, that's actually very important. I don't think we should forget Alberta, and I think we have forgotten Alberta. A lot of the East and that comment being, we don't seem to understand. I, I don't think it's a matter of we don't seem to understand, we just seem to forget that there are people there who also matter in this right. country. So, Okay, Ariana, quick comment from you. Yeah, I definitely think that that's one of the hugest things is the element of national unity and figuring out whether we are going to be going forward with a um, more unified or less unified country. Mm. It definitely seems like we're going in the less unified direction, um, but hopefully that we can have these kind of conversations now that we're becoming a more prominent issue, I think, in Canadian politics and actually have that kind of putting yourself in other people's feet and trying to understand where people are coming right. from. Yeah. Okay. Final thought from you, Mehdi? Yeah, I think going forward, it's going to be really interesting to see how the kind of the country goes forward. Um, I think in the case of Alberta, I think like we haven't had like a premier in Alberta since Peter Lockheed, where there was like kind of like an incentive to diversify with like, things like the Alberta Heritage Fund, etc. I think in the status quo, there's been kind of like Albertan's identity is interwoven with oil and I think ultimately even without considering the risks of like climate change and environmentalism since it's su such a hot and cold industry I think it's it's, it's difficult to like go forward with that um, so I think ultimately we do have to the rhetoric has been kind of toxic I think blaming Albertans isn't the right way to go about it I think it's it's something where right. we should incentivize change and diversification of economies 
Okay, listen, thank you all for being part of this. It's been great to hear your perspectives. John, thank you as well. Bye. Great to have your insights, and uh, we'll see where we go from here. I want to thank you for watching, and I will remind you that we will be back tomorrow at 2 o'clock Eastern Time with another edition of Have Your Say. I'll see you then. Thank you for watching. One word of our story. For the complete story, CPAC. For the record. Democracy moves quickly. Stay on top of it with primetime politics. Join Peter Van Dusen for the nightly program Canadians rely on. Democracy Speaks on primetime politics. See it on CPAC. Your connection to people, to communities, to our country. Your connection to the full story. CPAC, created by Cable for Canadians.